Hey everyone, welcome to How to Think, the show where we take a look at people who have overcome the odds and done amazing things with their life, and we explore how they think so that we can learn how to be more successful ourselves. Today we have John Whiting on the show. John went from being at the lowest possible point in his life where he was literally contemplating suicide to completely changing how he thought, entire way he viewed how the mind works. And as a result, created a million dollar business and multiple actually million dollar businesses and literally just completely turned his life around. And it was so impactful for him that he began teaching other people this sort of uh, uh, different way to look at the mind. And it's very deeply rooted in controlling your emotions and using them as a tool rather than allowing them to prevent you from getting what you want in life. And so that's what we're going to explore. And of course, as always, if you would like to get daily success mentoring, go to howtothink.com and sign up. It's an amazing app where you will get a daily success audio each and every day to keep you on track and show you how to work towards a more successful you. So with that said, let's get into the interview. This is How to Think. What's up, John? What's up, dude? Bulletproof entrepreneur. How you doing, man? Good, brother. How are you doing? Pretty good. Long drive over here, right? Incredibly long drive. All 30 <laughs> minutes of it, baby. <laughs> well, that was easy. So I'm, I'm so happy to have you on the show because uh, we've been doing business together for some time. And uh, I just wanted to get you on here because we've had some pretty crazy conversations. Understatement. Outside of a microphone. And to a degree, I'd like to get some of those conversations <laughs> on a microphone. Not all, though. Um, but uh, so listen, I, you know, I want to start with um, sort of like where where you came from, because, you, you know, you have this company, uh, Bulletproof Entrepreneur, and it's a successful company. You teach entrepreneurs how to improve their their mindset and the way they think and their mental game, which I'm all about that. You know, we, we do that at How to Think. Yours is very, very specific, though. And I like it because it's a very, it, it's, it's, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's very based, or at least it's somewhat based in stoicism, correct? Yeah, a lot of the same principles. So just real quick, for, for those that may not know what that is, can you just quickly define uh, what stoic is and why especially an entrepreneur may want to consider looking into that? So ultimately, non-reactive, right? So as entrepreneurs, we get bullets shot at us constantly, right? Mm -hmm. Not to be too punny, a bulletproof entrepreneur, <laughs> but ultimately, you know, how you respond or react to those bullets coming at you determines what happens, right? So the less reactive you are to external forces, whatever it may be, the more, uh, the better decisions you're going to make. Just like Warren Buffett says, if you can't manage your emotions, you can't manage money, you can't manage a business, you can't manage a team, so on and so forth. So the less reactive that we are and the more calm, cool, collected, logical and methodical that we are, pretty much that's, that's why Warren has a hundred million, hundred billion dollar net worth. So um, it's worked for me as well. So, so in essence, are you saying basically to not be emotional? Uh, it's a tool. Emotions are a tool, right? So it's either you can be cause over your emotions or effect to your emotions. So emotions, I'm not saying throw them out. What I'm saying is you, there's a time and a place to demonstrate certain behaviors, certain emotions. And many times the things that get us, us in the biggest trouble is when we reactively do something that we then look back and say, hmm, probably shouldn't have done that. Right. And so the more um, causative that we can be over that, usually the better decisions, therefore the better actions are for the better results. So like stoicism would then be the art of being able to make a decision and essentially letting only logic rule how you make that decision and not let emotion get into it. Is that is that sort of like a simple definition? Yeah. Incredibly fair. Yeah. Incredibly okay. fair. OK, so. What would be your response to people who, because I can I can already hear this, right? I can I already see the peanut gallery drawn out there, picket signs and holding them up and saying, "Well, we're not robots. We're not, you know, yeah. human beings are emotional." And I, I believe that you have to understand the context that goes with it, 
because you know if you're saying oh you're raising children or you are um you know in a relationship yeah if you completely strip emotions out probably not going to go there's, there's probably going to be some negative negative fallout to that because you you totally. are a robot but when we're talking about a business we're talking about growing a business it it's a different context so what would your response to be those that would push back on the idea of stripping out the emotion to make good decisions yeah i would say if it's working for you uh, keep doing it oh uh, come on you don't have to be that nice <laughs> well so in a, so full, like just full disclosure every, every time that i talk to anybody i'm like everything that i'm all about is a suggestion that has worked for me has worked for my clients and it's led to a great part of my success um, in what I've done so far, but it might conflict with beliefs that you have. If that's okay, great. Like my intention is not to completely, um, change your entire fundamental belief system. If you're not liking where you are and you're extremely emotionally volatile and you're arguing with me about it and you don't have the results that you want, I might invite you to look at it a different way. But I'm not saying this is how it is. This is what's totally 100% absolutely true for everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying what's true for you is true. So if what you're doing is working, I'm not trying to convince you. What do you think the people that, that, that might listen to this and say, oh, you know, you, you, gotta, you, you can't strip out all the emotion. I wonder how many of those people, <laughs> it is working for them. You know, they, they are successful. Because, I mean, if, if you think about it, there are definitely some people that are successful who you might consider emotional like donald trump or something though the jury is out on whether or not that is intentional and and calculated or that's literally a reactive sort of thing because i think a lot of people may look at you know they, they may look at uh somebody like like that or or somebody in the news that is emotional that mm -hmm. is that is and they might think oh well you know it works for them they're fine but in reality maybe they're doing that on purpose well yeah exactly so like i said emotions are tools right so they're tools in your tool shed that are meant to be used so either they're using you or you're using them so you can't for example uh sell anybody on anything if you have no emotion you can't do it so what you have to do is strategically use that emotion so for example somebody calls uh, comes to a call with you and they're like man this is really tough you're not just to be like okay, buy my stuff. You know, like, like it, that's not going to work. Right? right. So you're gonna be like, Hey man, I understand. I've been where you're at. You know, it's, it's tough. Well, I you're get talking it. about like, selling though. You're talking about marketing. And selling. Regardless, it's still an emotion well, that sure. you're using as a tool. But right. I'm talking more about like making a decision in your business, something that's off camera, off, off of the public eye, sure. you know, because you're right. Like you, you, if you are, you're out there and you're just like a robot like this, nobody's going to relate to you right, because exactly. human beings are emotional creatures. And if they can't sense that you do have an emotional side to you that they can relate to and resonate with, no, but what I'm saying is outside of all of that, you know, just in the deep, dark core of yeah. you wake up in the morning and you say, am I going to go this direction or am I going to go this direction? Yep. Am I going to do this or am I going to do that? Those decisions. Yep. Do you, do you feel that emotion completely is a detriment or do you feel that it, it just, it's more of a degree? I think it's worth taking into consideration, but the way you take it into consideration, you have to be kind of exterior to it in order to, to, to practically take it into consideration. You teach this incredibly well when you essentially, uh, we good on language on? Yeah, you can okay. say whatever you want. So, you're talking about the second mind? No, 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 what I, no, no, no. So you're like, don't come to a coaching call and tell me I feel like my sales are down. I feel like oh, this, yeah. I feel like that. What are the numbers? Right. Exactly. Because I can only help you if I understand this is why you've got to make data on decision or you might make decisions on data, not emotion is because how many times have you and I both like felt like shit's going awry. And then we look at how does it actually go? And you're like, oh, <laughs> we're actually doing pretty good. Yeah, it's it's right. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Cause, right. Because people do it's people it's entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs do this. They'll get out there and they'll say something like, well, and I've had people say this to me a million times. I feel like this isn't working right and it's like well 
I don't care how you feel. Right. I care about the facts because the facts don't care about your feelings. Facts are facts. And I know we live in a world now where facts are, yeah, facts are, are, are subjective. Are now, you know, facts yeah. are subjective. But the, the bottom line is that if, if something isn't working, you're going to be able to no, if you actually check, I can't tell you the amount of time somebody said, well, this is the problem or this is what's going on. I'm like, well, let me look at it. And then I look at it. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? That has <laughs> nothing to do with what you just said right, like, exactly. right here. And so I agree that I, that emotions can be a, a you know, a, a detriment. And, th and just to give you a practical example, look at social media influencers, right? So here's the funny thing is I can make a post on my social media and it'll get like 12 comments or whatever, you know, cause I'm not like a huge, I don't think either one of us are huge social media people. We're entrepreneurs and somebody will be like, oh, you can't possibly make a bunch of money cause you got 12 comments and it's like, okay, but my ads and all this stuff, when I look at it, we, we did like a million dollars this mm -hmm. month. So it's, or whatever, you know? So it's like, like, I know, like I know uh, Anthony Morrison, he he doesn't do the guy the guy does crazy numbers insane numbers multi 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 eight figures and he's not that active on social like if you did not if you weren't on his email list or you weren't a part of his actual closed sort of door tribe of of you know hundreds of thousands of people you wouldn't really know who guys like that are compared to somebody who gets out there and posts a stupid picture of their food or their sneakers or a lamborghini they don't own or some new age rap music that even rappers don't know what it is you know like i mean it's it's a it's a huge thing and when we get emotional about attention oh i want attention i want people to mm. know who i am well great but that doesn't necessarily translate into dollars no totally Absolutely. And that's why, you know, ultimately it's kind of, I like the analogy of like, this is literally how pilots fly planes, right? Would you get in a plane with a pilot who says, um, you know, I, I think, I, I feel like this is going to go okay. Uh, <laughs> no. Right. I, I feel pretty good about this. Uh, but he has no dashboards or dials or data on anything. He's just like, I'm, I feel pretty good about this. Like he's got black tape over yeah. all of the instruments on the plane. Let's just assume it's a plane that doesn't exist. <laughs> that, does, that, that whole thing doesn't exist. And you're just like, yeah, I feel pretty good about this, right? Like, no, you wouldn't get in the plane. Why? I would get off the plane immediately. You would get, right, exactly. I'd be like, I've got to take a pee not in this plane. Yeah. And then I would not come back. <laughs> right, exactly, right? And so ultimately, especially in business specifically, like you can't attract a team if they don't know, like using that plane analogy, the team won't get on the plane if you don't know your own numbers and you're not able to show your team, hey, here's what happens when you do these particular things using the systems that we have in this company that are proven to work. If you don't have that to show them, their confidence is very low and they're going to feel uncomfortable and not really probably even know why, right? And so ultimately the more when that's why you have to have data on everything in your business is because that's how you need to make decisions as you what you were the one of the first people that like I really heard go aggressively on like just don't fucking tell me how you feel anymore I just want to know what your numbers are well well look I'm gonna be honest with you right here's what happens in in the consulting space um, people will sign up to get business advice but what they really need is therapy yeah. you know what I mean like, and I'm, not, and I'm, I'm not kidding like they'll sign up because when I first got started teaching people business, I did not, un I did not even realize that I had to be a therapist mm. or a mindset coach. You know, I, I didn't even realize that. And you do, if you teach anything, you have to be to some degree a mindset coach because people will come in and you could be like, here is what you do. Click here, click there, do this, do that, say this, say that. And if they do it, it will work. Right. But they don't because they're like, but, and then, insert all of these emotional things and you're like wait a minute i signed up it's like if you were a firefighter and you signed up to be a firefighter and then they're like hey can you go arrest that guy well i'm a firefighter i'm not a cop but see the thing about it is is that in in, in perry belcher uh brilliant guy said this to me one time and i'm sure he said this to a lot of people but he says like if you don't solve the customer's complete problem you're leaving a lot of mon money on the mm. table so if you want to be successful, 
even in, not even in a coaching business, but in, in a, in any business, yeah. right? Like could be a gym. Like think about this gyms, the, some of the best gyms, they inspire people to lose weight in their marketing and in their messaging. Yep. If you just walk into a like, but if you think about it, the business model is, Hey, here's a, a box. Here's a key. Here's a bunch of gym equipment. Give me 20 bucks a month. And there you go. Mm -hmm. But it's not, you actually have to inspire people. And a lot of people don't realize that. And so you can either get frustrated with that or, or you can, you can tackle it. But, um, have you noticed that like, if you were to do a percentage of tactical versus mental, mm. so tactical, meaning say this on the phone to close the sale or, you know, do this thing in a stock market to make whatever, right. you know, versus the mental aspect of it where it's like, okay, here's how you manage your emotions around that. If you were to give that like a 70, 30, 50, 50, 60, 40, where would you, where would you land that? I mean, ultimately, I think an 80, 20 is fair. Mm. I think it's fair. Um, ultimately, even the, the tactic and tactics and the strategies are fueled by a decision making process that is through some sort of an emotional lens filter in and of itself. So you could argue that it's the whole thing is 100% mainly because your perception drives how you would even come up with or interpret tactics in the first place, right? So you could argue that it's a hundred percent, but I would say to be fair and practical, like, yes, you need the how to's and they need to be accurate. However, you and I both know that building a business really isn't that hard. It's you share your message with a lot of people, find out what they want, go out and get it and give it to them. And you yeah. package it up in a way that you can ha pass it off to somebody else to delegate to. And you repeat that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. I mean, that's, like, that's, I mean, there's your tactics yeah. right there. The, uh, it's honestly, Hey, what do you need? Like you just said, like you, you, the problems that are left unsolved or whatever it is that you just said, uh, are you're leaving opportunity on the table. And it's just, you know, I forget whose quote it is, but you know, you help enough people get what they want. You get what you want. And what's funny is the questions that you and I both get is just like, and I even shit, I ask you for things on your perception. You're like, I don't know, go ask your target market. I'm like, oh yeah. So like a lot of the time <laughs> like, we have to be reminded it like most of our job is reminding people of things that they already know. Oh, you need to say that one again for those in the bleachers. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's absolutely true. I right. mean, be, I have literally paid for coaching myself yeah. or masterminds where I will hear something that I already knew that I already yep. acknowledged I should be doing, but because I heard it again, and maybe I just heard it in a slightly different way, or maybe it was just the fact that I got on a plane, spent tens of thousands of dollars to go out there, sat my ass down instead of watching a stupid YouTube video and actually was there fully present and heard it again yep. that I finally did it. And then boom, it turns into millions Perfect of example. So the other day, um, and I'll leave his name off, but there's a, a new client that I just signed up um, that does a hundred million dollars a year. Okay. And in our conversation with each other, he, we, we were having conversations similar to this and probably went down some rabbit holes um, but ultimately he's just like, I, I said something similar. I'm just like, honestly, dude, like my job is really simple. All I do is remind people what they already know, who they really are, what they're actually capable of. And just like, get them back on track. He's like, that's exactly what I need. He's like, I'm so glad you said that. He's like, that's exactly like, I'm like, oh, okay, great. Like, awesome. Yeah. Like it's just, it's business is so much simpler than people try to make it. And you well, know, that's what, that's why they overcomplicate it. It's the emotions, exactly. the emotions drive the overcomplication. Exactly. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I've had somebody come up to me, maybe even they just saw me in the street or something. And they're like, but uh, he asked this question and I'm like, dude, I've never even thought about that. I mean, you've actually asked I've me. A asked you, of, yeah, yeah. You've said that to me. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, I've never even remotely thought about that. I just do this. And, yeah. and, and, you know, and you're, and I, and I've asked people that. And I've heard that same yeah. thing. And I believe it's, it's, it's anything from fear, uh, could be anger, could be self-confidence issues, could be ego that cause you to do things that lead to an overcomplication. You know, I, I mean, I would say that when I started teaching people business tactics, I was not including like mindset right. or, or mental game stuff. And quickly I realized, I'm like, man, these people like really 
they need therapy really bad. Like these, like I just thought they would just do the thing and go get results. Yeah. I didn't know I had to basically like, you know, heal their mental trauma or whatever, yeah. you know? And, and so then I, I, I had to, you know, I had two choices. I could either not do that and be a mediocre player in the game, or I could learn how to to do that and and study and experiment and then eventually i started putting mine like literally the first things the first modules in any programs i put out yep. were all mindset and all of a sudden like crazy the the loyalty the brand loyalty went up the um uh the results went up everything went up and also those were like the the parts people remember because people you know people may not remember tactics but they remember how you make them feel mm -hmm. and um it, that was one of the reasons i started how to think because i was like well, wait a minute i was like why don't i just make an entire company based off of this and because it look and i will and you you can push back on this if you want but i firmly believe that if you take two people and one person has has a shit mindset and they're they're they have a, a crappy attitude, but they have the most effective tactic on the planet. And then you take somebody else who has a, a, a growth mindset and they have confidence and they have willpower and they have all those, they have the mental game on point and you give them a subpar tactic, they will still crush the other guy no every single time. No question. Yeah, why would I push back on that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought you were gonna. I thought there. you were gonna lob me up a hard one. Yeah. Like, no, like, that's a, why would I push back on that I one? Mean, no, you know, uh, just trying to get some some uh, viral uh, clips for the show. But uh, no, <laughs> I mean, that, that that's the thing is, you know, that's why that's why I started how to think, and I'm sure that's why you started Bulletproof Entrepreneur. Absolutely, because you realize it doesn't matter what business they're in or what they're trying to do. If they don't have the mental, I mean, I've told you, I've told you my little analogy on this multiple times, you know, Tom Brady says the game of football, 90% mental, um, uh, you know, Michael Jordan game of basketball, 90% mental tiger woods game golf, 90% mental. What makes you think business is any different? Yeah. And, and we were talking about this before we started recording, but take Tom Brady as an example. Um, we'll use a different analogy than what we <laughs> used prior, but probably wise, probably wise. <laughs> yeah. would get a viral clip out of it. Though. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you can um, circle back. Yeah. So, so Tom, I, I'll never forget this. Tom Brady said that the guys that are in the NFL that are gifted with like huge muscles and they're naturally athletic, they often are, are they don't reach the top often because they, they have so much given to them that they don't know how to develop heart. Mm. And he says, when it comes postseason time, when it comes time to win championships, muscles don't win championships. Muscles don't win rings. Heart wins rings. Look at Tom Brady. He is not physically like, you know, he, he's not that jacked. He is not yeah. a, a, a athlete, overly athletic you, you see him in the street, you, you would never think he was an athlete, yet right. he's the greatest quarterback of all time. And it just goes to show you that that is the mental game. The heart is the mental game. So no matter what you do, if you can develop that, you can crush. And the number one person that needs it the most is the person that says, oh, mine says bullshit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how, how, how often have you seen that as something that's like really held people back their resistance to improving their mental game? Um, I would say in, as a general, it's the number one thing, right? It just goes back to the, you know, 80, 20 or a hundred percent. Like it's literally the one thing, like you've heard me say my, my drunk sober analogy, right? So for those of you who haven't heard this, why would you? unless you follow me already. Um, <laughs> but, you know, do you make better decisions drunk or sober? We'll just go through it. Well, I would say sober. Sober, right? How about when you're afraid or nervous or anxious or really frustrated? Do you make better decisions in that state or when you're calm? Uh, when you're calm, for sure. Calm, right? So when you're in one of these frustrated, very emotionally volatile or even like super excited, like overly excited states, you tend to make decisions that's kind of like being mentally drunk, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So ultimately, when you're talking about, you know, I can, if I gave you the best how to strategies and tactics in the world, but you're blacked out drunk, will you be able to do anything with it? No, no, no. 
right? So what happens is, and this you is what- You might puke, but- <laughs> You might puke, right? But ultimately, at the end of the day, like what everybody else is trying to do is like most people are walking around in some degree of mental drunkenness. And what happens is, is they're going to evaluate solutions, solve problems, look at tactics and strategies, wandering around after shots of fear, guilt, doubt, frustration, anger, resentment. And they're just, you're taking shots as soon as you wake up. Let's say you sleep in too long and you feel, oh, my energy's low. Now, now you're like feeling wah, wah, wah. Right as soon as your eyes open, you're like, oh shit, today's gonna suck or whatever. Let's take a shot of self-doubt and then a shot of guilt that you slept in too long. And then you're wondering, like you just keep doing this throughout the day and you're wondering why you lose focus, why you can't do it. Like it's just literally the same thing. And so ultimately that's why we take entrepreneurs through a process to essentially sober up their mind so that they don't experience that. Or if they do, instead of you and I, have you ever met somebody who sat in a problem? Like let's say they got dumped and they sat in it for way too long. Oh yeah. Right. Oh yeah. So, I, I live in Florida. That's like everyone. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so one of my favorite definitions of wisdom is the speed at which you're able to see both sides of an event and neutralize it and transcend it. So if you, let's say you get dumped and you sit in it for eight years or 80 years, sometimes that's not the most wise way of operation. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So if you're able to, and there's like, I'm not saying take emotion out of it. Like if your dog dies and you're just like, oh good, like that's a bit sociopathic. I'm not saying go there. I'm just saying there's an appropriate amount of time just as a reasonable you know, processing of an emotion. Whereas most people, they got rejected in something that they even forgot years and years ago. And now today, that's why they're afraid to ask their target market, their audience, hey, well, how is it that I can help you? So they hide behind a consultant and go, hey, consultant, what should I say so I never experience rejection? And our challenge is, is there's no answer to that question. We're not the one, I can't give you the answer to that question. It's literally impossible for me to tell you what to go say to your target market, which is why every time I bring an idea to you, you're like, I don't know, good dude, go test it. I'm like, yeah, that's a good point. Well, see, I always say, I can't tell you the answer. I can just tell you the process that will get you the answer. Sure. Cause I don't know the answer. I've right. never known the answer. But, but we'll, what will keep somebody from executing on that is a fear of getting rejected, a frustration. It could even be something real unrelated. Like they're frustrated with their ant because their ants being an asshole during the holidays like it could be you know it could be literally anything that causes what I'll, I'll i'll name mental drunkenness right and so now it won't matter how good the advice is how determined you are you'll find a way to fuck it up essentially and what happens is is you go do like whatever it's meditations affirmations journaling whatever Let's say you're hammered drunk and I say, all right, we're going to meditate, do affirmations and journal. You're going to be like, scribbling, you're drunk. And then, I don't know, this isn't working. And then you get distracted and go do something else. And then be like, I don't know, I tried that shit. It doesn't work. None of that stuff works. And you loop it into this big generalities bucket because you're not getting specific on anything. And you say, none of that worked. I tried it all. You've seen that. How many people have you talked to who said, yeah, I tried everything and it didn't work. And they've tried two fucking things. Uh, well, that virtually everyone, right? Virtually exactly everyone. I mean, you, you cannot begin. I mean, I, I've been on thousands of coaching calls. Uh, I've, I've spoken at tons of event. Like it's ridiculous how, like, I'll give you a perfect example, right? Like, let's say somebody says, um, well, you know, uh, I'll, actually, um, I, I've literally had people try something. Uh, and, and they say, oh, I, I've tried it. It doesn't work. Mm. And I say, well, how many times did you try it? And they'll literally say once. Mm -hmm. And I'll be like, so your expectation is that you try to do something that you never have done before. And just because you have got some guidance, all of a sudden, right. you're supposed to fully and completely execute it on the very first try. The problem that you have is not anything technical or, ta or tactical, it is your emotions s telling you to set that insane fucking expectation right. that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Yep. And that's probably also holding you back in multiple categories of your life. 
literally permeating your life like a fucking virus. And here's the thing. They already knew that. That's what they're really upset about is they already know that. And when you remind them of that, it reminds them that they already knew that, but they're not demonstrating it. So ultimately, for example, if you're drunk and I'm like, hey, Dan, don't be drunk. That's my advice, right? It won't matter how, lo- hey, Dan, let's sober up now. Like, like, have you ever tried to tell a drunk person, like, all right, sober up now, like get your shit together and they, they can't do it. Is it their fault? Eh, I mean, yeah, they got themselves drunk, but ultimately like we're saying, in so many words, like, well, you're a fucking idiot for not, you know, <laughs> for not seeing yeah, this like, logic like here. You're trying to reason with a drunk person. Correct. You is, can't reason you with can't. a drunk person. Yeah. So what's the solution? Is it reason harder? An IV. <laughs> <laughs> An IV. But see, that's what you do. You, exactly. Your stuff is the the IV. Correct. It's it's the thing that gets them. I like that. I'm going to use that analogy. Yeah, you should. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know, I'm the IV. You're drunk and I'm the IV, you know? <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, mean, you use could a say, different voice tone, but yeah. I mean, you could say you're the mental <laughs> cocaine because that'll that'll wake you right up. But I probably wouldn't do that. That's um, a, <laughs> we'll circle back to that. Yeah, one. that that's uh, yeah, that's that's probably an audience mismatch. But um, the the point is is that, and I want I want to be clear. A lot of people associate mindset work, and this is important. They associate it only with things like confidence and fear, mm. and those are yes, those are very very common. But there are other cancers out there. For instance, I personally have not had in a while, um, you know, maybe early on in my career, a lot of fear. You know, like I, I lately, the past four years of my life has generally been, you know, me taking more risk than I probably should, not less. And I think that may come because they, they may come from such abundance that, you know, when you're a when, when you're pretty much poor your whole life and you deliver pizza for seven years, which is like a huge, and I'm so pissed off that I let that be that big of a chunk of my life. And then you have like tens of millions of dollars. You get to a point where you're in such a state of abundance that, or at least I do, where I might take risks that are, that could pay off this big, but a seasoned investor would probably be like, mm. you know, n- you know, no. But it's worked out. Like when I did the uh, the music video for uh, Book and Close, you know, I had a few people tell me, they were like, you're going to get all kinds of hate for this. People are going to say you're objectifying women. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, it's a fucking parody from a movie. You fucking idiots. Like, you know, like, wh- like who's going to do that? Yep. And then I was like, wait a minute. Idiots will do that. And I don't want idiots to buy my stuff anyway. Yep. So then I was like, all right, it's fine. And then it blew up and we did... $850,000 off of that ad on like something like 15 or $17,000 in, in advertising costs. It was ridiculous, yep. you know? Um, but what does hold me back personally is things like anger, frustration. Um, and I know it like, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs, especially those that have employees can appreciate this, or at least acknowledge that they, they see it in their life. But you have an employee or maybe it's not even an employee maybe somebody you've hired like outsourced and they do a bad job or at least not to your standards yep but the thing is is if they were to do it to your standards they probably wouldn't be working for for you they would have their own thing and some people don't want that they don't want that life it's it's a life but to have to expect because you're you're pushing yourself to this insane degree right like you're pushing yourself harder as an entrepreneur, you're pushing yourself harder than most people are willing to push themselves. So when you put that expectation onto an employee, you're basically saying, hey, I'm a fucking lunatic. I'm gonna push myself to this crazy degree that 99% of the population is not willing to do. I expect you, the employee, part of that 99, to be a lunatic with me. And they're looking at you like, you're a lunatic, you know? And then you're like, why can't you do this right? And it's like, because you're expecting them to be a lunatic because you're a lunatic right? and they don't want to be a lunatic. If they were going to be a lunatic, they'd probably go off and start their own business and be a lunatic. Right. You know? So I think that's important that 
it's not just people who aren't afraid, who do have confidence, but there's other things that can fuck you up as well oh, yeah. in your business. Oh yeah, totally. And for on that point specifically, like one of the things that, okay, and I, I've used this analogy, I'll, I'll soften it slightly, but in, when we were at your, uh, uh, at your penthouse a couple months ago or whatever, when you asked me about this, do you remember the analogy that I shared with you about the kid in the grocery store? Uh, we, we were, we, okay. we were, we were eating some plants, but you'll have to remind me. So, uh, and, and this can go on the mental, just I'll, I'll use the drunk analogy just to keep it congruent. So imagine everybody that is on this planet for the most part, to some degree is drunk, right? Mm -hmm. We're going around expecting them to be sober and they're not. And it's frustrating. Right? So ultimately we're going around saying you should be sober as I am. Now that also can come from a different kind of your own mental drunkenness. And now you've got two drunk people just arguing about nonsense. Because your expectation because, is making you drunk. Right. And their expectation of you is that it's not going to be that hard. And you're just like, you know, going back and forth with like two drunk idiots arguing and on the front lawn and you know, middle of Florida. Right. But ultimately, you know, if you, if, if you at least understand logically, that's like half the game of like, okay, I, like you just said that, that argument that you just made, like definitely a prerequisite to working with people in general, like, especially if you're a high performer, like you just have, a, like, there are some people that have more horsepower than others. And so you're driving around in, you know, the La Ferrari and wondering why the Camry is going slow. Well, it's not that it, it's cause it's a fucking Camry. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so you're expecting like, come on, Camry, go. It's just like, well, you hired a Camry and you're expecting it to be a Ferrari. Like that's on you. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So, right. but it also back to ownership, oh, oh, everything does. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so like the most empowering position you could possibly ever come from is I caused it all, literally everything including all the things that you're going like, wait a minute, not that though. Yeah, that but too. E so what you're saying is even if you were to be able to make a logical argument that it in fact was not your fault, bypassing that and taking ownership yes. of it anyway really is the secret to Correct. crazy amounts of success. Correct. Yeah, I would agree 100%. with that. 100%. I would agree with that. 100%. Have you read Extreme Ownership? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great book. Yeah. A lot of, lot of war stories, you yeah. know. I feel like that should be a movie, but... Uh, yeah. But so let me ask you this: you you built a million dollar business um, when you did not come from, you know, bit like you didn't come from Harvard Business School or anything like yeah. that. And two, well, two seven figure two businesses. two seven figure yeah. businesses. Well, we can't we can't leave out the. That's hey, one thing about entrepreneurs. I don't have tens of millions of dollars yet, but you know, that's all right. I, I understand because like when somebody like so my dad, we have this. I have this running joke. My dad always says. He'll be like, ah, you know, I'm so proud that my son became a millionaire. I'd be like, multi-millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, don't leave out the multi, baby. Yeah, that's right. But uh, so, so let's go back to, you know, I, and I, we had this conversation again yeah. off camera. And I know that there are certain aspects about this you don't want to share. So with whatever you want to fill in, um, take me back, way back to when you've the journey that allowed you to discover this sure and because i mean to, to sit there and come up like what you're saying makes sense right what you're saying makes sense it's it, about it, time i said yes, something that made it, sense it, it, <laughs> it clearly works it has worked for you it has worked yeah. for people you've worked with uh clients that you've worked with it works but now that we know that it works how did you even figure this shit out? Like, how did you, yeah. how, what happened that you even like, I mean, I know that what, what you teach isn't just like being stoic, like it's right. way, way, that's just like a sort of like a sprinkle, but how did you come up with this? How did you learn this? Yeah. And so it's not that I don't want to share certain aspects of it. It's that the individuals that have helped me along the way are uh, preferred to remain anonymous yeah. and private so and so okay. on. So uh, it's just out of, out of respect ultimately. Um, so uh, brevity, I'm working on brevity <laughs> here. Um, so ultimately I started my entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial journey in 2011 after essentially I'll say failing as a pro golfer to keep it simple and straight, um, had put my whole life into golf and how do you fit? Hold on. Let's, let's, let's break this into chunks. How do yeah. you fail as a pro golfer? 
So pro golf, here's the best analogy I got. Imagine the only way to actually make a living as, on, as an entrepreneur is, is you have to be on the Forbes list. If you're not on the Forbes list, you're basically broke and homeless as an entrepreneur. That's essentially how professional golf is. If you're not one of the elite, you're, it's literally elite or nothing. And so there's probably about 25, probably about 20, 25,000 golfers on the planet that you could probably just plop into a PGA Tour event of usually the fields are about 150, 160 guys. And they would have a shot at at least making the cut, if not winning the thing. There's only 125 spots on the PGA Tour. So basically what you're saying is, and let me correct me if I'm wrong, if you're not on the PGA Tour, you're shit. You're basically not making a living. And as, as a pro golfer. As a pro golfer. And if, I mean, I don't know how many golfers there are in the world, let alone pro golfers, but I would imagine there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Uh, that, that, that could potentially play at that level talent-wise, 20 to 25,000 globally. Okay, and out of that 20 to 25,000, only 125 can make a living. There's 125 on the PGA Tour. There's about the same amount on the European Tour. And then there's okay. a couple smaller tours that each have the same, but there's literally under 500 golfers that are making a really good living playing golf professionally. So those numbers are not the most favorable. Like literally, it's not like as an entrepreneur, like you can suck and be irrelevant and make millions of dollars relative to like Elon oh, Musk. Yeah. You know oh, what I mean? Yeah. So comparatively speaking, entrepreneurship is a cakewalk compared to making yeah. as a I mean, look at us. Nobody knows who the hell we are right. and we make millions of dollars. That's By the way, saying. LaCroix, if you're looking for a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> clinky, oh, clinky. <laughs> yeah, how lame. So I, um, I essentially, I had gotten to what I consider like the best that I had ever gotten in my life and was still nowhere close. And I was just like shooting great numbers. And for those of you who understand golf, there was the last tournament that I ever played in. I shot six under par and missed the cut after two days. Now golf tournaments are four days. You play the first two, they make a cut from like 160 guys down to about 50 guys. If you miss the cut, you get zero checks. Okay. Jeez. Brutal. So, yeah. And so shooting six under, I was like, I played well this week. It's not like baseball where you can get paid a million dollars to sell Oh, there's the no salary. There's no salaries. Oh, yeah, that's right. You don't get, yeah, yeah, no. yeah, yeah that's true. You have to basically raise money from investors to back you in this incredibly it's basically gambling it's in, exactly it's so like pool. it's like it's like being a professional right. pool player so, but most of them make it off gambling right not, not the tournament like the tours that i played on was basically organized gambling because there's no like tv sponsors and shit so you have a whole bunch of guys that are each are paying 1500 or two thousand dollars to play in the event you have 160 guys play, paid two thousand dollars this would be a larger event uh that i had, would play in and this was that would be like the best of the best under the pga tour essentially to keep it simple for all you guys that want to nitpick my the like, corn fairy tour and all this other shit that's not <laughs> what i'm going here i'm trying to keep it for entrepreneurs people who don't nitpick. know shit about golf well so, people, people that nitpick are too busy nitpicking yeah. and not doing big shit so yeah whatever. but ultimately like you pay you pay two grand for an entry fee so does everybody else the purse is three hundred twenty thousand dollars 160 guys after the first two days they cut to the top sometimes 50 to 70 depending on how they structured the tournament so if you miss the cut you've donated two thousand dollars to the pot and you've had to cover your own travel expenses everything else and by the way you're playing for a living so you're probably not doing something else and if you are doing something else you don't have enough time to hone your game as well as the guys who have enough money brutal. backing them brutal and so you miss the cut you've traveled that week thousands of dollars you've paid two thousand dollars just anywhere from a thousand two thousand depending on the size of the event but then you know winner gets probably let's say of that particular tournament might get 50 grand second place 25 third place 12 fourth place 10 it goes down very quickly so let's say you're you make the cut and you finish 50th and you make a check of 950 dollars but you spent three grand to get there and two grand to enter oh my gosh so, so you quickly realized I, this was not a long-term I, su I survived two and a half years. 
And I got to the point to where, you know, and I dropped out of college to do it. My family wasn't super keen on that. And they were just basically like, whatever, go do your thing. Mm. Uh, but we're not going to support you at all. You need to be in college and do the thing that we need you to do. And I'm like, fuck that. So <laughs> I drop out and spoken um, like a true entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. And so I had kind of like, I went two and a half years without talking to my family. I was just like, if you don't want to support my dream, like what the fuck kind of support is that? Like, fuck you. It's where I was at the time. And, um, so I was kind of like off on my own doing this thing and I was going to make it. And I had burned every bridge. I'd burned all my boats. I'd burned up everything to the ground pretty much. Um, and it just got to a point to where I kind of had this realization. I had gone through, you know, all of the resources that I had missed this one cut after playing the best that I thought. And, um, I was pretty much hitting the darkest point that I had ever gotten to. Like I just put everything into it and I was just like, I don't, I don't know what my options are. Like I either miraculously get better tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> or I go get a job, which I'm just like, fuck, like, you know me, like can you picture me going and getting a job. Like it's <laughs> <laughs> just not going to happen. And I'm like, well, what then? Like, and then, so at the time I was just, I was really seriously considering checking out and uh it got what do you mean checking out off in myself okay. and um, that's heavy yeah and um it was just where i was at the time and, and the only like when i say go get a job i don't mean like go into corporate america and maybe make sick figures i was like i don't know i don't have a degree i don't have any qualifications this is how i was thinking at the time my resourcefulness was nil. My mental drunkenness was an all time high. <laughs> and, uh, I was just like, I don't know, go work at subway. And I'm just like that. I'd rather fucking kill myself than work at subway. So basically you were like, you took give me Liberty or give me death to a whole new level. Oh yeah. And, um, and at the time I had like, I didn't know shit about shit about shit aside from the fact that I just like, I don't know what I was just sitting there. Like, I don't know what to do. And, uh, that's what essentially, and I had a, one of my sponsors and slash mentors, if you want to call it that at the time I presented him with my quandary and I said, so I have see it as I have three options and they all suck. Like, what do you, what do I do, man? And he's like, well, I don't know what's best for you. Only, you know, what's best for you and whatever you decide to do, I'll fully support. And I'm like, okay. And at the time, like when I tell that story, people are like, he said, what he supported that. I'm just like. At the time, like based on how our relationship was and where I was, I was just like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, what are you going to tell me to do? I don't know. It reminds me of that commercial. Have you seen it where the girl's like, you know, I just, I, nothing makes me happy and I'm so depressed. And so I asked my dad what to do, or my dad told me and he goes, just smile more. And, and, she, and she's like, and it's like, want real advice or something? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Solid. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I took that and I was like, well, that was kind of like the nail in the coffin with that particular relationship. I saw that like, he has no idea what to tell me. I don't have any idea what to tell me. And so either I mean, to be fair, that's a pretty heavy, heavy thing. I know, you know? Yeah. 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 Nobody said this, one, this one was light. Yeah. If somebody <laughs> asked me that I, I would, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't know, man. I, I wouldn't want to touch that one with a 10 foot pole, but no. unless I like really knew the person, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, and so, you know, in retrospect, that's honestly, um, the, some of the most, probably the most important words that have been spoken to me in this lifetime, uh, just because it, it's what caused me to like, all right, I'm got to figure this out. Unless he said that to you on purpose. You ever thought about that? He didn't. Almost like reverse psychology? He, he didn't. Okay. All right. Well, it sounds like you're pretty confident on that. I'm one. pretty confident that he didn't. Um, yeah, based on the, the events that followed there sure, after sure. and so on. But regardless. Um, so that's what caused me to start, like, searching for, like, well, instead of, literally, instead of going and killing myself, I was like, well, before we do that, let's just see if there's another way of doing things. And I started just Googling, like, how to fix my life, <laughs> you know, like, and, uh, that's what led me to just, that was the beginning of, I'll say my personal development journey. But I, that I, and I jumped in with both feet on just like literally everything that you've probably ever heard of personal development wise. I've not only dabbled in it, 
I've drank the Kool-Aid, mixed it with other Kool-Aid, bathed in that Kool-Aid and brushed my teeth with it. Like I was all in. Injected it, it you know, right. put an IV of that exactly. in there. Yeah. So and you did, you did all the events, all oh, the yeah. seminars, you mm -hmm. went to all of the, the group outings. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And you know, the, the saying of, you know, you got to go find a mentor and work for them and learn from them. And it's going to be your fastest way to, you know, accelerate your success and whatever. So oh boy, did I. So at different events that I would go to, I'd like do deliberately go like, who is the, like the richest dude that I could go work for and whatever. And I just like network around long story short over the following six years, literally six different States, six different companies, six different opportunities, if you want to call it that. And bottom line went into all these like, Ooh, this is going to be great. I'm going to learn how to do everything perfectly. Cause I got in with this dude. And then I very quickly realized in all of those that they had no idea what the fuck they were doing. And that pissed me off. Cause I was like, damn it. I moved across the country. Like I literally lived and moved to six different States because of who I met. I'm like, whatever, I'll do whatever it takes. Cause how they many said, times did you have to hug people that you didn't know and jump up and down and clap? Too many, and <laughs> too many. That didn't help you. Unfortunately. Oh my gosh. No. And I really, pl I played full out. <laughs> Um, and so I, I've, after six years of like, okay, I'm a persistent motherfucker. Like I so at some point, I feel like I'm doing all the things that these books are saying to do, but I've still like, I literally net didn't make more than honestly, probably like $18,000 in a year doing this. Dude, I know, I know school teachers that make more than that. Uh, no shit. <laughs> you can sense the frustration that yeah. I was feeling at the time. Right. And so I'm just like, I'm literally, I've read all the books. Like I, I literally read a couple hundred books, went to every set, like I personal just, development books. Yeah. And just like was doing the affirmations, doing the meditating and doing the routines and the wake up at 4am and the green drink and the fuck it, like you name it. Like I, everything that I could get my hands on. And I'm just like, there's still something like, it's clearly something's wrong. Like I shouldn't like, I'm, I consider myself a relatively intelligent individual. I even did back then. And I'm just like, I still suck. Like, why am I still sucking? So I got introduced in this series of introductions in these networking little pods that I got in. I got introduced to a guy who introduced me to a guy who introduced me to a guy who just picture Yoda in the swamp in star Wars, right? Off grid, super short, and super green. short and green, right? Exactly. 8,000 years old, whatever. K kind of has a shitty attitude, but in a comedic type of way. <laughs> <laughs> so I get, uh, I get introduced to this dude and I basically tell him the story that, uh, I'm telling you. And he's like, Hmm, I understand. I might share something with you that might be helpful. So he essentially shares with me an entirely different model of how the mind works and essentially how to unfuck it. And I'm like, if there's a way to unfuck it, like if there's anybody that is the poster child of needs unfucking, it's me. Cause now not only did I have like the shit that I was carrying, but now it's kind of like I use this example. I had uh, a mental alcohol addiction, we'll call it right. Not an actual alcohol addiction, but I was, you know, pretty right. down. Yeah. It sounds like you so, were more than, more than fucked. You were like double fucked. I was double yeah, fucked. Maybe. Yeah. We, uh, we'll get your whiteboard <laughs> out. You can, you can draw it for us. Um, That's a little uh, e Easter egg for anyone who's followed me for a length of time. <laughs> no pun intended on the length of time. Um, so, uh, essentially I was pretty down mentally drunk to the max. And so what I started understanding is all of this, you know, Oh, I got to be positive. Want to be more positive. Got to be, do the positive thing. Think positive, be positive, talk positive, blah, blah, blah. And so it's essentially when you're actually drive, you ever tried to talk yourself out of being drunk when you're wasted and just be like, all right, hold it together. You got this. Just we're sober. We're sober now. It's going to be okay. You know, like have you ever yeah. been that drunk, uh, yeah, it's, or, I don't, or I, seen anybody that drunk. Yeah. Be, mul well, I've owned two bars. So yes, multiple Perfect, times, right? which is one of the leading causes of right. why I switched to marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. There's your first kids. <laughs> um, so I essentially, it's it, the feeling that I was experiencing is it's kind of like, I know I'm drunk, but here I am. The advice that I'm being given is if you tell yourself you're not drunk for long enough and hard enough with enough emotion, you will be sober. 
I did that for six fucking years and I was still drunk and now I was a lying drunk. And I'm, I felt it like, and especially like you go to some of these events that are very uppity. <laughs> Um, you see people that are just like, uh, you ever met the person who's like, oh, isn't it amazing? Aren't you fantastic? Things are wonderful. Oh, I'm so grateful. Like it's just, yeah, I kind of, I kind of want to like watch that person trip and fall <laughs> into like a bed of spikes <laughs> and then film it in slow motion and watch it over again. Yeah. That well, not my favorite person. And later <laughs> he'll tell you how he really feels. <laughs> I just like, that's just too right. intense for me. Like, well, so, you know, so the, so it, it essentially I was just, I was feeling like I, I knew I do, couldn't go there. I'm just like, I don't, that I can't like, that doesn't make sense to me. And that seemed, that feels fucked up. So, but what I started to see is like all of the traditional stuff is like trying to balance out an alcohol addiction with a cocaine addiction and kind of hopefully find a medium, uh, a mid balance. And I'm like, well, that doesn't seem that sustainable. And most of these people don't actually authentically seem not only happy, but like real. Yeah, I, I no, see, that's the thing is I've been I've been to a lot of these events, right? And and I'm going to say this, and I know I'm going to get a lot of heat for this. Let's go. Viral clip so, coming up. Here's the thing. I have never, and I have been at the table. I'm fortunate enough because, you, you know, when, when, when you make millions of dollars and you make waves, you get to sit at the table with other people that make waves. It's just like a thing. They're just yeah. like, oh, come on over. But if you haven't done that, they're like, who are you? But when you've done it, you just get access. Yeah. And I've sat at the table, literally dinner tables with dozens of eight and even nine figure entrepreneurs and just thought leaders and people who just have done awesome things. And I've never once ever once heard a single person say the secret to my success was daily affirmations right. or, or pumping myself up. I've never ever heard that yep. most of the time, actually all the time it is mindset. It is a mental game related but it's not in the way that you would think it's not in the ah, right. you know like superficial bs you know hypey stuff right. it's more it, it's it's stuff you don't hear you know it's yeah. stuff that you you don't see on tv you don't see at events and it's it's just this whole like writing down what you're grateful for like i don't need to write down what i'm grateful for i know it because i have a brain that fires neurons from one side to the other and i and i understand you write something down you retain it it sinks in all that but i just the these to me the, these seems like parlor tricks to me mm. they seem like like exercises and activities and parlor tricks yep. because how many people do that i write down my daily affirmations every day Okay, well, what what has that done for you? Like right. deep down, ask yourself. And you know what? It probably has helped a lot of people. It has. But if you have huge dreams and you want to accomplish big things, yeah, that may help. But that's not going to be the yeah. thing that actually moves the needle yeah. and actually makes it happen. It may help. It may give you comfort. But it's not going to be the trigger. Well, and it's 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 in. Here's the thing. It's like, I'm, if you write down, I'm sober and I'm so happy and grateful now that I'm sober while you're taking shots of whiskey over here, that's what's Mental happening. Mental whiskey. Mental. Well, let's well, just, either one, either, yeah. one it's, <laughs> either one's fucked. So ultimately, um, what, what changed the game for me is when I was introduced to a, a different concept of uh, essentially how the mind works and this in it was shared much differently but the he's like hey you're mentally drunk we got to sober that shit up i'm like i feel fucking mentally drunk like how do i do it so he ultimately took took me through um a series of essentially frameworks and processes to understand not only like what was actually happening but also how to essentially i'll just say neutralize to a better extent and just like get rid of the mental drunkenness kind of like as if you were going to uh, like a, a drug rehab program they go through and they sober your body up of the toxins and you sober up like there's no other way around it you got to go through the shit to sober up so i essentially worked with i i moved yet again and i'm like whatever it takes dude like and he's a he's a essentially he works with like i think five or six multi multi-millionaires and actually a couple billionaires and he's kind of like i'll just say like they're private yoda he's off grid he doesn't even like he uses a different name than his actual real name 
uh, for a number of different reasons. That's a different story. Um, and so I'm just like, dude, like, what would I have to do to like work with you? Like, I feel like what you're sharing with me is the first thing in my entire life that has ever made any fucking sense. And if I don't do whatever I have to, to like do what it is that you just shared with me, like, I don't know that I'm going to fucking make it basically. And, um, so we worked out an arrangement and, um, I, that's when I kind of started a foray into a digital marketing type world and, uh, was a part of, a one of these other, the, the last of the six people that I moved to work for was still kind of dabbling around there, doing my best to add as much value as I possibly can. And, and, you know, ultimately my income kind of started changing slightly, but after I worked with this guy for four days a week, six hours a day for two years, pretty much with no breaks. And best thing I ever done in my life. I'm the only person that I know that would even come close to actually being insane enough to do that. And you're, are you talking about, just to be clear, are you talking about the guy that you met that shared this thing with Correct. you? Correct. Okay, got yes, it. Yes, yes. Um, and I basically did whatever I had to, to exchange with him uh, to work with me, essentially. And as, you know, as, as anything good that you've learned, you're just like, I want more, I want more, I want more. I want to understand this more. I want to master this. I want to understand this more. This is like the fucking it. And so coming out of that is when I, I kind of just, when I start kind of was wrapping up my, my time with him in person, we're still in touch. Uh, but wrapping up my time with him in person is when I started, I'm like, all right, this one company that I'm working with, like, it's not going to work out long term. And just like everybody and their dog in 2015 and 16 bought uh, Ty Lopez's SMMA thing. And I'm like, all right, I could see myself doing that agency thing. And so I like religiously like started going through that. And I'm like, I think I could do something. And so I literally, long story short, eight, within the next 18 months, um, built a multiple seven figure agency. We had 400 monthly recurring clients. We had a team of 24. And uh, one of those clients said, uh, hey, I really like what you're doing and we're actually looking to add an agency to our portfolio. Would you be interested in selling? And I said, yes, I think I would. <laughs> and so um, in fall of 2019, um, we made a deal. I exited that, took about eight months off. And um, I said, you know, what do I, what do I want to do now? I don't want to, and I had sold, I had just like you, you know, I had taught, you know, how we generate leads and how to close them and all the how to's, how the how to's, how to's, how to's. And I sold like 3000 programs on my lead gen program. Um, and, but I was just like, you know, platforms change every five minutes. I'm like, I don't care enough to keep up with the LinkedIn algorithm anymore. I just don't want to spend my time on that. That's just not what I want to do. And so I was like, you know, what would I like, what would I do if I had a billion dollars? I'm like, I've never shared what it is that I went through. Now, when you say, what would you do if you had a billion dollars? You yeah. mean, what would you do if you didn't need money Yeah, and you did it? because it was what you wanted to That's do, right. what you wanted to share. That's right. Yeah. Got That's it. right. And so I was like, you know, I've never shared what I went through. The challenges, what I went through was all intensive one-on-one, -on -one, very not scalable. And so I, I was like, but you know, I, I think I'm a smart enough guy. I know enough about, you know, marketing and programs and sales at this point to probably get something to a point to where it could be scalable and still as, it may be not totally as effective as I went through, but still incredibly impactful. And I took about three months and just sat outside by my pool and just kind of like messed around with concepts and ideas. And uh, basically six months later, I launched a beta of what was called Bulletproof Entrepreneur. And um, I basically almost had not a whole lot built, but I knew what I was going to build. And I was pretty sure it was going to be pretty banger. Um, and that was 14 months ago. Uh, long story short, we've taken 210 entrepreneurs now uh, through this process where we essentially, it's a removal process of essentially sobering up the mind so you can do the shit that you know you should be doing. And when I, when I speak, I say, how many of you guys know you have the next level within you? and you're just trying to get it out. Everybody's hand goes up, exactly. You don't need to step into a new version of yourself or invent yourself, you're already it. Mm. You just gotta unlock it. 
You just got to sober your ass up. And so I, we've taken 210, something like that, entrepreneurs through this process, and we track all of our statistics. It's very, very trackable, measurable, practical. We don't tell you to sit there and breathe and visualize and <laughs> all that shit. And if that works for you, by the way, keep fucking doing it. I have nothing against it. I'm all for if it works for you, do it. But we track every single statistic in our, the entire thing. And long story short, there's, we track a number of different things, but the two that really stick out the most is on average, average, a 47% decrease in fear, an 82% increase in focus, and an average of a 78% increase in revenue just by getting rid of mental shit just by sobering up the mind. And we haven't had one single refund request, one single support ticket, one single charge back. We haven't had any of that in 14 months. And we've done about one and a half million in sales in the first 14 months. Uh, last couple months have been over 200 a month. So we're trending. Um, and um, the, so we're- Yeah, your last month was awesome. Yeah, yeah we yes. did two, I think just about 260. So, so let's, let's, let's recap this, yeah. right? So let, let me give a recap and you tell me if I'm on point here. So you were mentally just messed up. You had a lot of, uh, negative emotions. You considered killing yourself. Like you were in a bad mental spot. Yeah. You tried all the personal development programs out there and none of them worked and they all felt very superficial and like putting a bandaid on you then met this met this guy who i might have missed where you met him or how you met him it was just we'll just say through networking through networking. yeah okay I, I was just sharing you know with some guy my trials and tribulations he's like you need to meet this dude oh so this was like a referral mm -hmm. got it okay so you met so you met this guy and i know more about what you're than what you're sharing now so i'll just recap what you said but you know, you, you met this guy, he, he shared a different perspective with you on how the mind works. You were so captivated with it that you do whatever you could to actually work with this person for an extended period of time, very closely. And you dedicated your life, that second of your section of your life to it. Then when you were done, you went off and you pretty much did the same stuff you did before, but now you did it at an incredibly higher and more effective uh, rate. You made more money than you ever had and then you sold you, you sold the company um so now you had even more money and you realized that you wanted to do something that was more impactful that really meant a lot to you so you wrapped up sort of what you had learned in this experience with this with this person and you turned it into uh, an educational or, or consulting program and you've made now like last month you've done over two hundred and sixty thousand dollars with that program um and you have incredible results you have incredible uh uh you know uh student uh case studies and all that jazz and it all really came from just a different perspective on how you think correct now isn't that incredible that no huge change in tactics or strategy, but just the clearing of the mind and, and the improvement of the mental game, not the strategy game, not the tactical game, yep. but those are important, you know, but the improvement of the mental game led you to just radically changing your life and just turning everything around. Accurate. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an incredible story. I'd love to dive more into, you know, the, the, the guru that you met or whatever you want to yeah. call him. But I know that there's aspects of that, that, uh, there's aspects of it, but I'm not, share. I'm not, um, it, uh, it's not that I don't want to share. It's just that he's asked me specifically yeah. for reasons that those reasons why he asked know, me that yeah, I'd I rather know, not yeah. share. I'm, I'm familiar, um, yeah, but yeah. So D and, and what was, let me just, cause I, I can hear in my head, I can hear people with their little objections. Um, I've seen it firsthand. So like, I, I don't, have any objections to this i've seen i've you know and, and i've gone through your stuff and it's freaking amazing but what besides just the fact that when this person explained this to you mm. and it made sense yeah besides that what about that person made you feel like this was it this this is the real real way to think about things um 
you know, it, it's kind of like you drinking that LaCroix. Why does it make sense to just take it with your right hand and drink it? Because uh, I don't want to hit the microphone over here. Okay. Why does it make sense to use either of your hands and just drink it the way you did? Why not go like this? Um, well, because that would look silly. Uh, probably because I'm right hand dominant, and this is the most efficient way to, to drink it. Just because it would look silly? Or is that the best way to get that LaCroix? Well, yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, if I try to lean over and drink it out of my mouth, I'll spill it all over the table. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So when you just, this just makes sense. Right. Why does it make sense? Because it's obvious. There you go. Okay. So you didn't, you didn't take, you didn't take any, so it, it made sense to you. Um, but was there anything else that, that gave you sort of like, that made you feel like what you were hearing was credible? Or was it just such pure, unadulterated logic that it didn't matter? If I tried to argue with you about your LaCroix drinking strategy, <laughs> right, w would you, uh, if I said, hey, how do you know that strategy is credible, what would you say? I'd say, uh, well, if I tried to do it any other way, you know, I can't think of another way and I, that I could do it which wouldn't create a mess. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. That's good. But the point is that it worked. The point yeah. is that, that, and, and I know a little bit more about the story well, here's the thing. That, here's that, the thing. of where it came from, but I get, I Tr get what you Truth you're resonates. Right. Truth resonates with people. Okay. And that's why back to our earlier conversation about like, our job is to remind you of what you already know. You already know the truth. Right. Mm -hmm. Every problem that anybody's ever brought to you, regardless of it's a mental problem, strategy problem, tactic problem, fucking who cares? They already know the solution. What they're doing is that you can either play big games or small games. Most people in general, not just entrepreneurs, but most people play very small games. So small if, is, for example, a small game being homeless guy trying to find cheeseburger in trash can and repeat that game twice a day for the rest of his life. That's a very small game. Elon Musk is trying to put people on Mars. Jeff Bezos is trying to deliver packages via drone on fucking demand. <laughs> Big fucking game. Right. So if you, the bigger the game that you play, the less bothersome the small games become. So you're either defining your big game or you're playing somebody else's small game. Mm. So if you mm. define your own big game, all of the, like Elon Musk doesn't have to worry about where he's getting food. Not because he's a master at solving a food problem. It's because he's focused on much bigger things and he's playing a bigger game. All of the small games become irrelevant and already taken care of. They're yeah. not worth toiling over. Right. So everybody who, and the homeless guy listening to this, probably not listening to this, he <laughs> knows this Everybody that is listening to this knows that to be a fact. I don't know, man. I, I, have you seen homeless people these days? They all um, have cell phones. <laughs> they all have like... Well, okay, iPhones. good. So I hope you fucking watch this. <laughs> Learn how to think. It's $7 a month for the <laughs> love of God. <laughs> Scrape it together. Okay. So ultimately, truth resonates with people. And when you speak truth, everybody goes, yeah, that makes sense. So the more truth that you... The, as they say, the truth will set you free. The only thing that will fuck you up is a lie. And so that's where like, like every relationship quarrel and any relationship, whether it's professional or intimate, doesn't really matter. Everybody knows that in order to make a relationship go well is you be understanding, kind, considerate, you communicate well, communicate often and help the other person meet their needs and allow them freedom to help, you know, like exchange. Yeah. Like, but just, execution is, is is way right. harder than just acknowledge. So the problem isn't that people don't know what to do, but they, they basically come to you, for example, for how to advice or me for how to advice or anybody for how to advice. They already fucking know how for the most part. The problem is they have this thing in their mind that is causing this drunk perception where they play this game of, I'm going to play victim and play this little small game of, I can't figure it out. It's a small game. It is a game. It's, and a, it's game. a game I see played constantly. Correct. It's so hard. It's it. Well, it's I don't have time. 
the I don't have time thing gets me. Oh, I have kids. Congratulations. So does everybody else. Yeah. That does not make you unique, special in any way. It means that you're a human that, that bumps uglies yeah. and, and procreates. That's not yep. a, a thing that is, you know, like you, you don't get an excuse for right. that, you know. And I'm a parent. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I don't have five kids or anything. I'm sure that would be much more challenging. But I know millionaires that have five kids yeah. and they still figure it out. And right. that's the thing is people oftentimes forget about the reward. Well, I don't have time to do this thing that would make me millions of dollars. Well, yeah, that's why people that deserve to cr create best-selling books, become famous actors, make millions of dollars, they are the people that found the time. It is not normal to be a millionaire. It is not, it, there's this massive, maybe you d agree or disagree with this, but there's this massive, massive level of entitlement permeating the world, especially the entrepreneurial world, where I cannot tell you the amount of time someone has come to me and said, well, I wanna make this a million dollar business, but I have some requests. I don't want to work more than this time. I don't want to do this. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, I can't do this because I'm an introvert. I mm -hmm. don't like being on camera. I da, 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 da. It's yeah. like, well, what can you do? You know, like, because it ain't going to be making a million dollars. Yep. You know, the people that deserve to make a million dollars are the people that do it anyway. The people that find the time. The people that take the excuses and just get rid of them yep. and do it anyway. And that's why you deserve those things. If everybody deserved that, well, then it wouldn't be worth much. Yep. So there's two P uh, let me fill in two blanks there that ties that into a fully complete everything. <laughs> How's that for a free preframe? Yeah. <laughs> so ultimately when you say Clearly, anyone kids can become a millionaire, even us, <laughs> us illiterate <laughs> assholes. I swear I've made a sentence before. <laughs> Um, so ultimately you, you said something very interesting. You said they, they forget the reward. It's not that they've forgotten the reward. There's two parts to this. There's getting rid of your shit. Now I use this as you've heard me use the Ferrari example. Mm -hmm. So you're already awesome. Let's say you're already a Ferrari, right? And per our previous mental drunk example, let's assume that, uh, like you have this Ferrari that, you know, Hey, you know, you got the next level in you. Yeah, I do. I'm just trying to get it out. I already know I'm a Ferrari. I can do this. All right, cool. What's keeping you from doing it? Cause you're watching your Ferrari bobble down the highway at 35 miles an hour is because we've got a bunch of engine gunk there was a rat that fucking built you a put nest regular in the engine, gas in it put regular gas in it whatever there's nothing wrong with the ferrari itself we got to get rid of the shit okay and the ferrari just becomes a ferrari what everybody else is trying to do is say hey my ferrari is going 35 down the highway and bobbling how do i get a turbocharger to make it go faster it's like you don't need a fucking turbocharger you got to get rid of the engine gunk and right? you got to put the right gas and you got to put the right gas in it okay but now that that's that's half of the puzzle because a Ferrari is not that fun with no place to drive it is it no not at all exactly I, I've had a Lamborghini and I've right. tried to drive it down here and that's why I right. sold it you can't so, know where to drive it so we got to give it a destination but if I asked you to pull out your iPhone and put in some place nice would it be able to navigate no no you'd have to put it in an exact location. exact location even if you put in uh Los Angeles it's going to navigate to it's going to choose a coordinate an exact latitude and longitude somewhere in la that it's going to navigate to so it has to be a specific location but that's not all because i could just say well that's great here's a specific location dan it's one two three main street at the gas station in bumfuck iowa <laughs> that's specific you want to go there no right so it has to be a specific destination that you have a reason for wanting to go there so there's that part. So we got to define where we want to go and why we want to go there specifically to make it a compelling destination. So that's when I say build your or create your big game. That's what I'm talking about. So you're either creating a big game for yourself or you're going to be reactively playing somebody else's small game. So once you get your Ferrari cleaned up, you're not going to play your big game or get to your big destination without a clean Ferrari. We got to have that. But we also have to have a very specific destination, a very specific reason why we want to go to that destination. And now all of a sudden, when you plug that destination in your iPhone, it reverse engineers all the turn by turn directions and you can pull out of your driveway and enjoy the drive. Right. So ultimately, it's not that they've forgotten the reward. It's they haven't gotten clear. They say, I want to build a million dollar business. What does that mean? You want to do exactly precisely $1 million in gross cash collected, net cash collected as a gross revenue. Is it like, what is a million dollar bit? That's a very vague destination. Well, well, and that, that's an incredibly 
good point because most people don't define what that is. Which is why but most people fucking in, can't navigate. Yeah, but in in general, what I'm what what I what I meant to say was they forget whatever the reward is, they forget how rare it is and how it is not something that is deserved to everyone and how it is let's just let's just right. call it becoming independent let's make it general let's call it becoming independently over abundantly wealthy yep. or, or maybe it's not even money maybe it's fame maybe it's a sports you know be winning a, a, a sports thing whatever it is right the you know the sacrifice like the reason why those things are so amazing to have and why so few people have them is because so few people are willing to do the things required to get them and that's why they're special. If it was easy to get them, they wouldn't be special and honestly, nobody would want them. So this expectation that whether it be an entrepreneur or anything that you come in and you say, well, I want this reward, I want this incredibly rare thing, yep. but I'm not willing to do the rare things to get it and is nuts. Yep. And there's, a, so that was, remember I said, there's two parts to this. This is the second. So there's a difference between want and intention. There's a difference between want and intention. Want by definition means I don't have it. Right. Mm -hmm. So if I put out, I don't have it, I'm going to get back. I don't have it. Think of it about it this way. You own two bars. I'm sure you've seen a lot of guys go into bars and really want to pick up chicks. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Very, very regularly. Very regularly. Are they successful for the most part? The guys who really are the really nice guys who fucking come over and just be like, you know, just say the awkward, stupid shit because they want it so bad Depends. and they don't want to fuck it up. If it's 145 a.m., 15 minutes before closing, it's slightly higher. <laughs> right. As soon as rate, the lights no. go up, everybody scrambles for the <laughs> worst thing they can find. <laughs> but, <laughs> but ultimately, in general, the guy who wants it, it moves away from him. Right? right. Just like if you really want to close a client. Right. Oh yeah. Because if, as soon as and you're in a sales situation, as soon as, as soon as somebody feels like mm -hmm. you need them. Yep. Well, right. If they feel that you need them, then they're not going to buy because nobody wa wants to be a part of something right. where they're needed. They want to be a part of something where it's almost like exclusive to get into. Right. So there's a difference between want and intention. Most 99.9% .9 of entrepreneurs want to be successful. 1% of entrepreneurs intend to be successful. And here's how you know. The people who intend to be successful do the fucking things, period. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's, it's I always say, and uh, I, I heard this originally from my, my good friend Myron. Um, I love this, this analogy is that... Uh, human beings right we want to have things we want to have success we want to have a nice car we want to have a nice house we want to have a successful business but we are not called human havings we're called human beings mm. and in order to have those things you must become the person that can make them happen you must yep. become the person that deserves them and most people just want to have things they're not willing to become the person that can make them happen. Yep. And that is the biggest, like, like once you have, that was, that was, see, that was my problem. When I, when yeah. I delivered pizza for seven years, I would just sit there like an asshole and be like, I want to have a million dollars, man. Like, yeah, like it'd be freaking great. And yeah. I never, ever actually sat down and got honest with myself and said, well, hold on a second. You know, I, I get up in the morning, I watch stupid cartoon. This is actually funny because this is what I do now. <laughs> but, um, you know, I get up, I watch, I watch dumb cartoons, like a total stoner idiot. I, I go and I, uh, uh, I don't work out. I eat crap food. I go to work. I come home. I drink. I get drunk. I wake up the next morning feeling terrible. I don't read books. I don't do any of those things, right? And then I, th I started thinking about what people who were successful, what habits they had, what kind of people they were. Mm. And I remember when I was just starting to like kind of get into being mildly like tiny successful. I'm talking like making like 500 bucks without a boss kind of thing. Right, yeah. I was actually doing, um, I don't know if you even know this or not, but I was doing airbrush tattoos. Do you know what oh. those are? Yeah. And 
so I, I get this, this, I buy this card, I invest all my money. And this was when my mindset was starting to like, you know, invest in yourself. Mm. I invested a few grand into this uh, cart that, you, you know, it had like stencils and a rolling cart. You could do airbrush tattoos. And that was a wild time in my life because I did everything from children's birthday parties to going down to Ybor City and uh, body painting naked women so they could dance on a bar with a river that ran through the park. It was actually quite disgusting when you really thought about it, but um, like I would not want to drink. Sounds at least more entertaining than the kid's birthday. Yeah, it just, it did, I just didn't think that it would meet health code. It's just, you know, <laughs> uh, but uh, um, so, so I remember I went, I got hired one time um, to go to this very wealthy family's private like birthday party. And I recall that they, like this was just like a birthday party and they hired like caterers and they had people come in and make like LED light. Like it was like this, some crap you'd see at Disney world, you know? Yeah. And but they had, didn't have strippers there. No, there were okay. no strippers. No, okay, I just want to make no, sure. No, this was a different gig. Okay. Um, hey man, I had to eat, you know, I'm just so, trying to keep up. Yeah. So, so, um, so, and they weren't strippers. They were just women that liked to dance naked with body okay. paint but they didn't have any of those at the kids birthday no okay no they did not <laughs> not that i saw i mean maybe, oh, okay. maybe they were off duty i don't know Fair. but uh, <laughs> but so so i'm sitting there right and i'm looking around i'm looking at these nice cars i'm looking at these nice houses and i'm thinking they probably dropped 50 grand on this birthday party for their kid and it just blew my freaking mind right and i remember i started paying attention i started paying attention to the way these people walk the way they talk i started looking at their house i started looking at everything around me and i began to notice things that were very different than how i lived my life and how the people in my circle live their lives i noticed that there were books right there were like very specific books and I remember how when I would do other parties for wealthy families, I'd see the same freaking books. I'd see the same behaviors. I'd see the same things. I'd, mm. I'd see very similar things. And I began to like understand that it's not that people become successful. It's that people become a different person mm. and that person deserves to be successful. And that's when I started like making changes in the way that I decided to live my life. Instead of watching cartoons, I'd listen to an audiobook. Instead of going out and getting drunk, I'd stay up and read blogs and, and read books. And, and I just started becoming a different person. And when I became a different person, that's when different things started to happen. And a lot of people don't really realize this. They want to stay the same person, but they want to have things that somebody else deserves. And this is a hard thing to swallow, but at that point in my life, I did not deserve to have anything that I have now. I'm, I did not deserve to have nice watches, nice cars, a penthouse. I didn't deserve any of that. It was only when I decided to become the person. Yep. And, and here's an easy way you can do this, right? Think of a version of yourself five years from now, 10 years from now, that is successful, that has all the things you want. And then get honest with yourself and ask yourself, am I that person now? How does that person behave? What does that person do differently than what I do now? And if, if you're honest with yourself, you should see a, a stark difference between the yeah. two people. And then all you really have to do is start becoming that person that you've put in your mind. But you gotta understand, you have to study people who are successful. You have to understand how they think, what they do, what their behaviors are. And that's the biggest hard, horse size pill, a uh, pill that you have to swallow is that it's not about having things. It's about becoming somebody yeah. that deserves those things. What I would well said, I'm going to put a spin on it though, that at least here's just in, in my box of at least the frameworks that I teach and whatnot, I would argue that that future Uber mega awesome, perfect, successful version of yourself is actually the real you. Oh, I would agree with that. And so instead it's your of highest potential, right? But I, what I'm saying is, is instead of becoming, I, I've noticed with people and I noticed with myself of like, step into this new version of yourself. Well, that's like, I have to become a different person. That's hard being more of myself. That's easier. So that's like ultimately the sober version of yourself, essentially for the, per the drunk sober analogy, all you're explaining is, well, for most of my life, I was mentally drunk and I've just gradually sobered yeah. up becoming my more just authentic, genuine, the real me. 
Well, I mean, that's like an alcoholic that that has been an alcoholic for a decade and and then they become sober. Mm. You could argue that they became a different person or you could argue that they became the person they were the whole time. That's just semantics. It the, is semantics. The, the just the is, idea is. Yeah, the idea. Right, it, right. Yours sounds a lot better, though, because well, the, it doesn't sound so scary. Well, here's the, and here's the reason is because the the real like there the additive is the alcohol right right so naturally the real natural you doesn't have alcohol in you right you're not emotionally right driven so but yeah. just per your per your alcoholic example right when you're saying well it's just semantics it might be just semantics but ultimately what's the real genuine authentic version well you didn't start out coming out of the womb sipping on some jack daniels <laughs> Right? right so there was this external additive that added something that wasn't you so like you're you're basically saying like your environment trauma things that, that that's what causes you to essentially have this mental drunkenness it's not the real you as much as i'm sure the stories as the the alcoholic would say i'm an alcoholic i'm an alcoholic well he might identify as that it might be real to him but the real truth is deep down he fucking knows that that's a lie because he didn't start out that he didn't come out of the womb an alcoholic. And so what happens is, is all of these other, I'll say traditional therapies and ideas and ideologies. This is where I kind of, I just have fundamental disagreements is where ultimately they're like, Oh, alcoholism is genetic. No. Who said that? Well, that's a, anything that they want to say, like as a behavior. So if all of a sudden they outlawed alcohol, and no more alcohol could ever be sold and I didn't know. exist. I'm not saying it's a valid argument. I'm be. saying I'm shitting on it. <laughs> I mean, that's just dumb. I like. know. Well, so my point is, is though, is many people believe things like that that put them in a bucket of a preconceived. They literally are creating the small game, deciding to create the game of I'm an alcoholic because of these external reasons that I have no control over. They're the only one creating that game. And the real thing that's actually bothering them in their lives mm -hmm. is they know they're lying that's the ultimate upset that anybody actually has is you know that you're not taking responsibility not acknowledging the truth and you're lying to yourself that's the only upset that anybody actually really ever has is they know the thing that they're complaining about is complete and utter bullshit and all they have to do is take responsibility for it and fix it but they just they're instead of creating a big game they're deciding to play a small game and stay in their little box. And then what they do is they hire consultants like you and I, and they come in and they ask us, hey, how do I get out of this? And we remind them of the truth and then they get pissed off at us because we remind them of the truth and say, I can't because of these reasons. And they just stay in this perpetual little small game closed loop, mainly because, well, it's because of the two reasons is they have all this shit, they got the gunk in their engine and they have no idea where their actual destination is. And so of course, you're just going to bobble around on this planet, a scattered mess. So you have to have those two things. So what, how do you, how do you feel about, um, the concept of, cause I, I've researched this and I've, I've, I've seen, I've, I've done a lot of, you know, late night, deep down the rabbit hole podcast and blog and YouTube journeys. Um, and, the this is a concept I, for, I forget the doctor whoever it is uh oh no it was jordan peterson mm. it was it was actually jordan peterson that that said this um yeah now that i remember that yeah so he said that basically you have thousands of years of human evolution okay and in this thousands of years of human evolution you have multiple problems that have been solved you have struggles that have been overcome you have all kinds of stuff that has happened and that this is imprinted like in our minds and in our brains throughout human history, right? And so as people are born, the potential and the ability to problem solve and be basically an amazing person, right? It's, it's, it's deep, deeply locked in everyone's brain, mm -hmm. basically saying that everyone through the simple process of, of human evolution has a very, very high potential, but we don't access it. And when you push yourself to certain limits or past limits, when you push yourself further than, you know, uh, um, 
then you're comfortable and you get to points where you are not comfortable and you push yourself hard, harder, harder, harder. It unlocks these, like the neurons, you know, fire and they form new neural pathways in your brain, sort of like working a muscle. And when you do, like if you stay in your comfort zone, these new neural pathways do not form. But if you push yourself beyond your comfort zone, these neural pathways form and they access this evolutionary data that allows you to be a higher version of yourself. Basically be smarter, be more confident, be have better critical thinking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason why most people do not ever access this higher version of themselves is because they don't push themselves. And I will tell you that when I heard that, it made a lot of sense to me because of the simple fact that when I was younger, I would consider myself kind of a dumbass. Literally, I'm not even joking. Like, you know how like kids will grow up and they'll be kind of nerdy and you'll know that they're gonna be smart and then later on they become millionaires yeah i was not that kid i was the one that was like that dude's never going to achieve anything he's an idiot and i just got to this point where i was continuously pushing myself to new limits and i literally feel like i got smarter mm. i literally feel like if i met myself when i was younger oh my gosh i would i'd be like this kid's an idiot he's never going to make it you yeah. know i would love to know your your take on that, if you if you feel that's accurate, um, I would again. What's true for somebody is true for that person, right? So for you, it's a workable model, it's a workable thought process, it's a work, it's a thing that helped you. So it's absolutely valid because of that. That's how you know. That's how you know if something is true, if something is workable for you, is if you actually see the actual physical universe tangible result as a result of that thought process. Right. But I mean, from a practical level, right? What, I mean, cause this is, this is a very practical thing, mm -hmm. you know, neural pathways forming and, and well, so here's the, here's the thing. So which one do I want to start with? So there are numerous cases y'all can Google this, um, of, people that have partial brains, no brains in their skull, that are fully conscious, fine, healthy people. And when you look at that and you talk about neuroscience and all this stuff, there's a reason why neuro, there, I, I believe there's two, there's two universes. There's a physical universe mm -hmm. and then there's a spiritual universe. You, when we talk about the real deep down you, that's the, you know, the all powerful being. When I say, I mean, you guys know you have the next level in you, me, the real, the you that that identifies with is the real you. You're playing this physical universe game that includes bodies and things that you navigate to create an effect and see growth and success and so on. And so ultimately what happens is, is all, all these neuroscientists, the genius PhD, awesome 20 year neuroscientist people are studying the physical universe to explain spiritual universe phenomena and they can't do it. So when they're studying, what is the nature of consciousness? This big motherfucking mystery. It's because you're studying the physical universe to explain the spiritual universe. And you won't find physical, you won't find spiritual universe answers by studying a physical universe thing like a brain. A brain is the effect you are the cause. So there's the argument that, uh, and this is actually testable. There's the argument that, okay, cortisol fires that causes you to feel stress, right? You've heard that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, actually yeah. it's the, the mental image pictures that based on how the mind works, remind you of previous things that have caused you to go, oh fuck, that's a bad thing we need to avoid that then trigger the cortisol. The cortisol is a reaction to a spiritual universe phenomena. It's not the other way around. So what happens is, is that's why there's, they literally just keep trying to figure out how consciousness works. And it's this big fat mystery to the actual neuroscience, physical universe science community. And everything that you've ever watched is a documentary on consciousness and brains and shit. The, by the end of it, they all end with, but it's still a mystery and there's still tons of questions that we have yet to un you know, uncover. <laughs> the reason is you're not going to fucking learn more about basketball by studying football. 
Mm. So you keep studying football to the and drill into the each little nub of the football and figure out how the laces are made. And you're trying to answer basketball questions. And so they're studying the physical universe to explain the spiritual universe. And that's why they can't come to a conclusion is because they're studying essentially the wrong thing. And so it's kind of like blaming the car for the driver being drunk. That makes a lot of sense. Right? Yeah, so if the car crashes and the car is fine, the driver's drunk. So you can study the car all you want to explain erratic driving, but it's the fucking driver. So all of these things, these pre Well, I'm sure in some cases you'll have a car that had some sort of well, no shit. issue. I'm yeah. saying- Because well, you know people are going to do that. They're going to be like, well, wait a minute. I have a hormonal imbalance or da 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 And, right. and, and that's, it does happen. And that, you will have cars that have a faulty thing. Wheel falls off. But also know. it's also been proven that anything that is in the physical body is also then remediable by intention. Like that's very proven. That, you know, a guy like Joe Dispenza, fucking perfect example, super famous guy. But even he, he, go, he flops back and forth. He argues that, you know, and I'm not like totally don't slam me in the comments. I'm not like a huge Joe Dispenza disciple. But my point is, is a lot of people are holding uh, conflicting beliefs and they'll, they'll be saying, well, uh, if you, you know, visualize and intend for something, you can heal the body. But at the same time, they'll be saying, well, cortisol just fires and it fucks you up. Which one is it? It's the chicken and the egg, which right. is the cause and which is the effect, right? So my point is, assuming the car is fine, <laughs> you can't explain a crashed car from a drunk driver by continually studying the car you will come up to the conclusion of, and it's still a mystery to why all these cars are crashing. You know, like it, you can't. Always that disclaimer. Right. Always, always. So ultimately, you know, it even, let's just say it is true. Are you more empowered or less empowered by saying, I have this external force that I have no control over? Well, I will say that, you know, it, it's not something I consciously did I didn't know that that was, whether it's true or not, that was, I wasn't thinking like, ooh, I gotta push myself so that I form new neural pathways. Right. But when I heard it, I thought, uh, you know, like you said, if it makes sense, it makes sense. Sure. And, and when I heard it, I was like, well, how else could you explain the fact that I literally feel like I got smarter? I literally feel like I, you know, is that- Intention. Well, sure, but at the same time, like if you were to put it on a practical, scientific, biological level, um, I've never heard an explanation that would fit, that would make sense besides that one. That one made the most sense to me. And I'm completely open to hearing another explanation at a later time that maybe makes more sense. But the idea that, you know, we have done things throughout history and those that DNA yeah. or whatever is in us. It, it, and it's also nice to think about because if, if you really think about it, it means that virtually everybody is capable of being something amazing. Correct. And if they just can push their se themselves to get out of their comfort, uh, comfort zone, they can begin unlocking the things inside their mind that allow them to do that. Now, whether that's true or not on a practical level, no, accurate. I have no you're idea. also you're also blending mind and brain. So tell me real quick, what is the difference between mind and brain? All right. So before I answer this question, disclaimer. What's true for you is true. The reason that I'm about to answer it the way I'm about to answer it is because it fits within the framework that basically encompasses the work that I went through that's helped me, that's helped my clients. But if you disagree with it, now you can flame me in the comments. I honestly don't care. My job is not to convince you of something that you... You really have this like politically correct answer well, stuff the, down. <laughs> the, well, the reason is, is because like, I'm not, I'm not here declaring, like literally everybody's job is to define what's true for them that works for them. Absolutely. And many people yeah. forget that. Yeah. And so, you know, if a truth that you hold to be true is working for you, please keep it, even if it disagrees with what I, whatever I say. Right. Because that's, my job is to empower you to have your own self-confidence and believe in, in your own truths. And so if I'm sitting here telling you, no, you're wrong, that's not empowering you. I want you to make your own assessment of what's true for you 
regardless. And many people forget that and they just start throwing stones at each other and forgetting that the whole point is to, like we've been talking about this whole time, is empower yourself to take control of your own shit and ultimately live life on your terms and be self-empowered. Yeah. And I think, I think also it's important to understand that when you give advice and you teach things, right? Yes. If what, like we can sit here all day long and say, this works better than that and yada, yada, yada. But what you're saying is true. What works for you, but there's 6 billion, there's more than 6 billion people on the planet. So what we can do is we can take a look and this changes and this gets updated, but we can look at what is working for the majority of people. What is consistently repeating that works and doesn't work. Like I can, like I can safely say to you that waking up every morning and saying, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to have a good day will probably help, Yeah. but it's not going to help as much as if you did further work. You know what I mean? Sure. And that's that maybe that's not true yep. in all 6 billion cases. Yep. But it's probably true in the majority. Yep. The vast majority. Right. You know, and I think that the the context that context is important. So, continue the difference between mind and brain. Right. So, let me give you an example. Um in right now, in your mind's eye, make a picture of a dog in the middle of that to actually close your eyes. Okay. Make a picture of the a dog in the middle of this table. Uh okay. Okay. Now point to the picture. All right. Open your eyes. Are you pointing to your brain? No. Right. So what's the difference between mind and brain? Mind is a mental image picture or a collection of mental image pictures from past, present and projected into visualized future. Okay. Mm -hmm. A brain is the essentially like the mind is like the driver of the car. The brain is the car. Okay. Got it. So the brain is the mechanical thing that makes this body fire off and do the things that brings the mind pictures into fruition. Somebody decided to create a beverage called LaCroix and make this all design and all this shit, but they came up with it. Their brain didn't come up with it. Their creative imaging in their mind came up with it. And they, that fired off the mechanism in the brain that caused the hand to move to boot up the computer, to do the Mm. Photoshop of the design and so on. So it's, again, it's a, it's a backwards perception that in, from what's true for me, I, it makes more sense to me that that's the case, especially when you start to look at, and there's a series on Netflix that's, I think it's called Surviving Death. Um, I don't know, Brandon, if you can verify that, just to make sure I don't point people in the wrong, but it's a very (laughs) interesting, um, it's a very interesting series because what it goes into is essentially, uh, you know, past lives and near death experiences and very interesting accounts. The most interesting and most practical being, and I'm sure you've heard the stories of the kid who like, you know, he's born and he remembers who he was last lifetime. He was a guy in a, and this is part of one of these episodes. He literally remembers who he was in the last lifetime as a co-pilot in what I think was World War II, remembered his partner's name, uh, went and like met the family and like, he's like four years old knows everything about the planes, everything, can recall it all. Now, if that was only in his brain, then he would literally, that would be physically impossible. So there's this mind that has mental image pictures with information. so much, so much sense. Yep. Like, I mean, it's, just, it, it, and it's a simple way. You that, see what I'm saying? Yeah. Back to, we're coming for a full circle here. You're like, how did sense. you know, man? What was it? Da, da, da? Well, I'm I think, like, I, well, because, you know, I think like with science, right? At the end of the day, when you state something as a fact and you present your logic to it, it may make a ton of sense, but that doesn't mean that new information down the line can't come into play. Correct. You know, like, like figuring different stuff out about the solar system, where planet X is. And so, I, I mean, I, you know, who knows, in a thousand years, probably less, our, maybe our consciousness will be downloaded into some metaverse shit and that's where we're living and we're, we're all in pods and all this crap we're talking about right now <laughs> means dick, you know, but you never know. But I, for, for what I've seen, and I want to ask you, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask you one more thing that I, if you could just share in like two minutes or less, because when you, when you talk about this, I love it. Um, uh, and I've, I've seen this help a lot of people, or at least this concept, the, the positive negative, the, hmm. the, um, the, basically 
do you think that being too positive all the time is actually bad for you? Absolutely. And in fact, it's is equal, if not even, well, it's equally as harmful as being too negative all the time. And the reason is, uh, how many stories have you and I both seen where the guy put his life savings in AMC or Reddit or fucking Dogecoin and lost his life savings? Yeah. Right. Yeah, was, so totally. way too fucking optimistic about that. <laughs> right. Un so when I was talking about mentally drunk, this is mentally coked up. Right. And so ultimately the truth is balanced. So there's two principles. There's a principle of polarity that states that essentially everything has poles. Okay. Everything is two sides of the same coin. There's equal positive and every negative. There's equal good and every bad, rich and every poor, and so on and so forth. It's just a perspective. Okay. So as, as our boy Einstein said, it's all relative, which is true. So there's no absolute polar truth of one thing is good or one thing is bad or one thing is positive or one thing is negative. Second law is the law, is con law of conservation of energy. It means It states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed or transferred from one form to another. So that means that you can't destroy negative to get positive. There's actually equal positive in every, every negative and equal negative in every positive. It literally, you can't destroy energy. It can only be transformed or transferred. So... That being the case, there's literally equal sides to absolutely everything. There's equal hot in every cold. The example that I use is, would you say uh, 130 degrees, if we walked outside right now, it's 130, would you say it's hot out? Yeah. Yeah, right? But if you and I stepped foot on Venus, it's 864 degrees Fahrenheit. Relatively, it's eight and a half times hotter. Now, how do we classify? Do we just classify both of them in the exact same hot bucket? No, 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 because if you were on Venus and it was only 130 degrees, you'd need a fucking you, coat. You, you, well, or you could at least survive, you know, like right? you would not survive if on a normal day. Right. And so my point is, is then you say, so now from that perspective, you're saying that Venus is hot and earth is now relatively cold. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So now the, okay, now uh, Venus is hot, earth is cold, but the sun is 9,941 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, what do I got to do with Venus? I got to like move it here. And then I, now the sun is hot. Venus is mild. Earth is freezing at 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, all of a sudden, there's no such thing as hot and cold. It's just a thing called temperature, just like everything in life. There's no such thing as a good event or a bad event. It's just an event. It just depends on how you want to look at it. And ultimately, once you like these laws, flame me in the comments if you want, because it's pretty much impossible to refute these. There's no such thing. People will try. Um, go for <laughs> it. It'll get engagement on the video and we'll get more views. <laughs> so ultimately, there's no such thing as good or bad. There's no such thing, no matter how catastrophic, these universal principles are true. Even There's like, no such thing as good or bad. Correct. It's all just, just like there's no such thing as hot or cold. It's all depending on how you want to look at it. There's equal good in every bad. For example, you, if you want to take like the Holocaust, you'd say that was bad, right? Yeah, generally, yes. <laughs> right. But how about, how about all of the millions of people that have had inspiring stories, have learned lessons that have then caused their second and third generations to now live differently and never have something potentially like that ever happen again for the rest of humanity? Yeah, I mean, I would say that is like a, a, a salvage job of a, of a like... Like there's that's finding good in an incredibly bad situation. Right. But is it untrue? Well, no, it's not untrue. Exactly. So my point is, yeah, we've salvaged it. And what everybody watching this is trying to salvage their lives. And the truth is there's equal good in every bad. There's equal positive in every negative. There's equal hot in every cold. And to the degree that you resist that concept is the degree that you're trapped with lies. Because remember, we, we talked about the truth is what sets you free. The lies are what piss you off and cause you to go, wait a minute, nah, nah, nah. like that's what causes fucked up shit. So to the degree that you acknowledge universal truths is the degree that you're free to operate, free to choose a perspective. That's how you can have empathy in sales and understand the other person's perspective and see their point of view without lashing out and needing to punch them in the fucking mouth about it. Mm -hmm. Right. So to the degree that I can, you can agree to disagree or I can just, huh, I see your side without needing to fucking cause a complete scene. Well, and, and I think it's important that, you know, uh, discussions be had and logic and, and facts and all these things that are pretty finite be able to be discussed without emotions wrecking the very 
foundation of reality right. because you know we we can have conversations we can say like one thing I, i'll i'll since you mentioned the call the holocaust which is always like the worst thing to mention but i i, I remember one time i was reading a, a book that was talking about um you know it was called the 16 word sales letter and was talking yeah. about basically copywriting and there was a section in the book i didn't write the book you know but there was a section in the book that that taught a very specific type of of speech sort of tactic and it said um that throughout history a lot of different leaders and and dictators and all kinds of different people would use this tactic and one example that it gave was hitler mm -hmm. and the holocaust and it showed how he used that that speech tactic yeah and then it said like you know basically what it said was if if a guy who was like four foot seven can get up there and use this speech tactic and inspire an entire country of otherwise rational people to do this incredibly terrible thing mm -hmm. imagine how powerful it could be if you used it for something good or this or that and i just thought it was interesting so i i take a picture of it that sentence and i post it on my on my instagram and i was just like you know kind of an abrasive point mm -hmm. but you know what do you guys think you know and I, I mean the vast majority of people agreed but but there were so many people who got so upset yep. at the very mention of, of hitler or the very mention of the holocaust that they didn't even actually read it yep. they didn't even actually try to comprehend it they just immediately got triggered uh, and would not even take their brain and put it in gear to actually even have a discussion. Mm -hmm. They just went, oh, I'm offended, you know? Yep. And to me, I remember when, when that happened, I remember I thought of you and I was like, these people literally just opened up Instagram, took a look at that post, immediately took a shot, took another one and then started babbling. Yeah, they chugged a bottle of pop right. off right there. <laughs> right, just at the yeah. sheer mention of it. And the thing is, is is this, this is the thing, this is why I, I don't agree with this whole being offended and and by just the mention of certain subjects is because they're touchy is because yeah i get it they're touchy but imagine for a moment that you wanted to prevent a terrible atrocity from happening again you wanted to be able to spot recognize and understand a person or an event that could happen that has already happened in history what would you have to do in order to to effectively understand that you would have to study it yeah right you'd have to, you'd have to study it you'd have to like actually look at what's happened in the past as terrible as it may be and you'd have to study it objectively objectively but if immediately you just think that's things bad and i hate it so much yeah. so i'm just not going to even look at it well now guess what you've done now that thing can happen again because mm -hmm. you weren't paying attention and it does happen history repeats itself and i i understand that it's terribly uncomfortable to look at things in history and things that have happened that are un, that are uncomfortable that are terrible it doesn't make us feel good mm -hmm. but it if you really hate that thing that much to me the most logical way to look at it is well i might hate it but i need to get past my emotions and at least under understand put put my brain in gear to understand it so that i can recognize it so that maybe i can do my small part to prevent it from happening again or at least i can see it happening and get the hell out of there yep you know and people don't think like that they just see it they get emotional and that type of thinking again what works for you is what works for you but i haven't seen it work for very many people when it comes to achieving True. things in their but life you and i both know that the only way to get somebody to see the light i.e close somebody on a deal or get somebody convinced of a new idea is to make it their own idea and the way you do that isn't by enforcing it it's by right. inviting it and hey if they see it they see it if it's not if they don't they don't and you, we can't care whether they do or not, which is why I'm just like, I'm not trying to convince anybody of a goddamn thing. I'm just here to share what's worked for me. And if you like it, great. If you want to shit on it, great. I honestly don't really care. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, that's what I've done my whole career. I've said, look, here, here's what helped me. Yeah. Here it is. If, if you want to do it, I, I view it this way. You're either going to love it. You're going to put it into practice and it's probably going to work for you, or you're going to hate it. You're going to talk trash and you're just going to bring it more attention 
to what I'm sharing so that people who don't disagree with it can see it more. Right. So either way, right. thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you right. for your, for your cooperation, right. you know, but I, I, I do agree that, um, you cannot save people. You can only lead them. Yep. And some people, I think everyone's worth saving, but not, but you got to save yourself. The only way to influence anybody is to be the example. Yeah. It's absolutely. the only way to lead anybody. It's the only way you can recruit anybody. It's the only way that you can sell anybody on anything is you have to be the example. And what most people are doing is they're being hypocrites. They're not there. Do as I say, not as I do. Mm -hmm. And what my, I have this analogy of, uh, my, this leadership analogy of imagine like this huge, like cruise ship tie up rope thing. It's like this big around weighs like a thousand pounds, like a thousand feet long. And it's got this big knot at the end of it. You slap it over your shoulder. This will be the last thing, I promise. You slap it over your shoulder. I'm having so much fun talking to you. It's, it's, we're, this is like the longest show we've, we've done. Oh, I know. <laughs> In fact, I did a podcast the other day, and it was the same thing. You're like, we're going 45 minutes. We did an hour 45, and they're like, fuck, I didn't know we went that long. Um, but so anyway, here's my leadership philosophy, and this has worked for me and everybody I teach it to. You have to decide on where that specific destination is. And then you don't fall out of your chair <laughs> <laughs> and you throw this rope over your shoulder and you just start pulling towards that destination. It's going to be really heavy. It's going to be really tough. Don't worry about it. You just keep pulling. You just keep pulling. There's going to be some people that come along and say, Hey man, you're an idiot for pulling that rope. This guy over here is he's pulling a rope. Why don't you just jump on his? He'll pull you. You can be a lazy bastard. Okay, that's fine. I'm just going to pull my rope, pull my rope, pull my rope. There's going to be some people that come along and actively pull against you. Don't matter. You just pull your rope, pull your rope, pull your rope. There's going to be some people to come along and be like, hey, where are you going? You tell them where you're going. You know what? Can I help you pull? Yeah, that'd be great. Keep pulling, keep pulling, keep pulling. You can't, you can't worry if they go away and stop pulling. You just keep pulling. There's going to be some people that hop on and be freeloaders and get a free ride. Don't worry. You just keep pulling. You just keep pulling. You just keep pulling. And ultimately, that's why you have to have a specific destination and why you're going there, because there's going to be there's going to be people that last and keep pulling with you. There's going to be people that pull against you. I don't care about any of them. I'm just keep pulling. And hey, if the people want to pull with me, I'm going to do my best to make the journey as enjoyable as possible. My job is just to keep pulling. And if I look at it that way, just consistently day in and day out, I'm ultimately going to be going in the direction of my own causation, playing the game of my design and doing the best that I can to help the people that want to be, that want to pull with me and be pulled. And hopefully I inspire some to create their own rope and then pull they, their own rope, you see. So ultimately, perfect example of this is Forrest Gump. Guy just starts running for no reason whatsoever. People, you've seen Forrest Gump. Yeah. People, yeah, the course. hundreds of people just start running across the country with them back and forth for no, and they're like, totally, it makes sense, dude. Like, that's leadership. You just be the example. And if you be the example for long enough, people will just start, like, going along with you. And so you have to be congruent, and that's why, that's honestly why Forrest Gump was honestly a great leader, even though he didn't really know it. He just consistently just kept going in the direction that he decided to go in, and he, you know, in that movie specifically, just created a lot of change and inspiration. So ultimately, you're not going to, a mind convinced against its will is of the same opinion still. So if you try to convince people of shit, it's wasting your fucking time. Just go be the living example of what you're trying to embody, the message that you're trying to spread. Just be, like you said, you have to be, you're not human havings, you're human beings. Just go be it and just keep being it. And don't second, don't second guess yourself. And if you just continue to consistently keep being the best version of yourself to the best of your ability, they will gain momentum and people will want to follow that and be a part of what it is that you're doing. And you can't be afraid of going years and years with nobody else wanting to pull the rope with you. You just keep fucking pulling. And that's ultimately what creates momentum. But yeah, trying to convince people, you can't convince people of anything. But you can if you have fucking results and you're going in a direction and people are like, damn, that shit actually works. Maybe I should do it. Not because of something you said to them, because of what they see. Mm. It's good stuff. It's good stuff, John. I appreciate you coming on the show, man. This was fun. This yeah. Was super fun. It's always fun. So uh, I'll leave some links in the show notes for, you know, checking you out and all that. Um, what's your favorite social media that you're active on? Uh, Instagram. So bulletproof.john.
And for, also for those of uh, those people listening that want to hear more out of you, we do have a masterclass from you on the How to Think app. You actually, you have one of the most popular uh, uh, masterclasses on, on our app. Um, and it is how to bulletproof your mind. Uh, so if, if uh, anyone out there is listening is a how to think user, you can go on, you can find John's um, course on there and you can snag it up and listen to it. And of course, if you're not a how to think uh, member, go to howtothink.com and sign up uh, to get daily mindset and success mentoring, as well as we do have our weekly business mentoring option as well. And you can find John's program on there as well as, uh, uh, you know, the programs, the, the higher end coaching that you sell and all that. We'll leave links to all that in the description, but definitely, definitely at the very minimum, listen to uh, the audio course that you have on the How to Think app. It is amazing. So thank you again for coming on, John. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you.